So I'm going to talk a little bit about the relationship between position, so anatomical position, and breathing mechanics and biomechanics. So how all of these things are interconnected. Okay, so if we consider we've got a human being here, so we've got a pelvis sitting in what we would call an, a neutral position, so it's as, it's as level as we, we can get it to be. We then have a rib cage above there, so we have a torso, and we have a piece of muscle which is attached to the front of the rib cage here, attached to the lumbar spine here, which then becomes hip flexors here, and then becomes quads. So that's one chain of muscle. All right. Um, this alignment is what we would call canister position, right? which means that the rib cage here is opposing the pelvis underneath it. Right, when these things are in the right place, so uh, a, a pelvis like a bowl here and a bottom of a rib cage like an inverted bowl, everything is where we want it to be. Right, the diaphragm can now get its signal to contract, which means that it will draw air in uh, and relax, and it will relax back up, and other things will mean that that air is then expressed out, which is what our respiratory system is supposed to do. Um, this re requires everything to be in the place that it is in at the moment. If for whatever reason that does not happen, and we have an alignment that looks a little bit like this, our anatomy has not changed. All right, so we still have the same things with the same things attached to them, uh, but they're all just in a different place. But we still have to have a rib cage, we still have to have a pelvis, we still have to have a diaphragm that's attached to the rib cage and to the spine, but they're all just in a slightly different place. All right, but this person, even though they're anatomically the same, are having entirely different functions. So on the left here, we have a diaphragm which is going to come up and down like this, all right, to draw air in and out of this space here. On the right here, we have a diaphragm which is still getting a signal to contract, but because its, it's anchor points have moved, instead of flattening and raising like this, what it's going to do, it's going to contract and it's going to pull the lumbar spine further forward. So this person on the right here is in what we would call a, a, a compromised position, in a disadvantaged position. But now every time he takes a breath, he's getting pulled further and further and further into that disadvantaged position because all of these muscles are still going to try and do the same thing. Um, so that's a, a mechanical problem that the person on the right has. And that's a, a simple relationship between position and respiratory mechanics. Now, where this then becomes a slightly deeper problem is if we look here on the left, all right, when everything's in the right place, the majority of gas exchange in respiration happens down here. That's where the majority of blood vessels are. That's where all of the good stuff happens. All right, so that's where, that's where we want to be having air come in and out. That's where we want things to happen. Now, if we are in, a, in this position on the right here, we're much less able to do that. That area has then become much smaller. So person on the left here has got to work, a, sorry, person on the right has got to work a lot harder to try to, to, to try to exchange gas. Now it also is not gonna occur down here because everything's not in the place to do it. So it's gonna occur up here. Now, in order for a gas exchange to happen up top, this person is gonna have to lift the top of their rib cage, they're gonna try and expand that area. So they're gonna start relying on accessory muscles to do that. So they're gonna start using things like their upper traps, uh, the muscles of the neck, the jaw, all of these things are gonna start firing up in order to lift these upper ribs and create some space up here. Um, so a person on the right is in a, a less efficient position to breathe, but now they're also in a less efficient position to move. Uh, once all of these accessory muscles start kicking in, they're not designed to do that, so they're not doing the job of other things. So a person on the right is now going to start experiencing um, these upper trap trigger points, these neck aches, um, they're probably a teeth grinder, um, tension headaches, all of that stuff, because all of this group of muscles up here are now doing an extra job every time they try and take a breath. 
All right, so that's why he's not very happy because that's not a great thing to be. Now that's a, a sort of a, a, a simple, a simple two-dimensional problem, um, but there's a little more to it than that still. So this is our person who's having problems. Now our person who's having problems, if we consider what's going on at this joint down here, right? We know that a pelvis will look a little like this, so it has a socket and it has a ball and it has a femoral head that sits within that socket. All right. If we're in this position here, all right. So this is this is our front. This space here gets a lot smaller, okay, because that has actually shifted from here to here. All right. So this person's ability to move this limb that way has now significantly reduced. He's got much less available space to do that because his position's changed. So his altered position has affected his ability to breathe, which has affected his ability to exchange gas, which has meant that some other muscles are gonna to start to fire up to lift his upper chest to create some space, but it's also gonna pull him further into this position, which is now gonna affect his lower limb mechanics. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is if we consider what's going on with upper limb mechanics here. All right, if we look at a torso, all right, if we were to slice a torso in half from the from the, the side, this is, all right, it should look like a, like an egg. It's a fairly strange shaped egg, but that's that's roughly what it should look like. So if this is the if this is the front, this is facing forwards. They're all facing that way. So this is the back of a rib cage. Now a shoulder blade sits like this on the back of a rib cage. So a shoulder blade has a curved front edge which corresponds with a curved posterior aspect or back edge of a rib cage. All right, so we've got kind of we've got ribs going like that. All right, so they now have they, they match. Okay, so we've got a, a convex aspect matching a concave aspect. Now that is in a optimally aligned human being. So that is that is this person. Um, okay. If it's this person, their rib cage doesn't look like that because they've lifted the front of that rib cage, they've arched their back just to try to breathe, just to try to stay alive. So they no longer look like this. They now will look like this. Okay, so they haven't got any bigger, they've just changed shape. All right, so we haven't created more tissue in this person. All we've done is we've just moved it into a different position. So their rib cage now has this flat back edge. All right, so if we've got a flat back edge, our shoulder blade has still got a curved front edge. Now they don't match. Okay, so when they don't match, this shoulder blade has nowhere to sit. So we now have a rib cage that looks like this on the back, and we have a shoulder blade that looks like that on the front. So they now don't they don't connect. Like they, they, this, this doesn't have home base. There is this space in between, and this is when we start to see that scapular winging. All right, so that that's a chicken wing effect that that then causes issues in and around shoulder mechanics and ability to put arms overhead and do lots of things comfortably up there. So, person on the right here has got a low limb problem here and upper limb problem as well. All right, but that's when we're only thinking in two dimensions. Unfortunately, for the person on the right here, this isn't just a two dimensional problem. All right, this is a three dimensional problem. So a diaphragm, if we were to take it out and flatten it, looks a little bit like this. All right, so it looks a little bit like a stingray. That's intentionally bigger on that side because that's how it is, right? A diaphragm is much bigger, thicker, stronger on the right than it is on the left. Um, and that's simply because this right hand chamber, so the right half, so if I have a rib cage that sort of from, from here, so here's a, here's a rib cage from the, uh, looking at it from, from the back, so here's a left and here's a right, right? This half of it is a much bigger space than this half, okay? That is 
because there are just more things in that left hand side right the heart sits here and all the associated plumbing that goes with that right so there is a there's a bigger there is a bigger chamber on the right and it requires a bigger sheet of muscle to drive the air in and out so when everything's stacked up and in the right place that doesn't really matter this is all this is all where it's supposed to be however when we lose position when this happens this contraction doesn't just pull Mr. Sadface forward, it pulls Mr. Sadface forward and to the right because that's a stronger muscle. Okay, so if we were to look at him this way, all right, he's creating not only a sagittal plane problem, so pushing himself this way, he's also pushing himself this way, or pulling himself this way rather, because this piece of muscle here every time he takes that breath, draws him over and to the right. Okay, so if he is being drawn over and to the right, this little problem here doesn't happen in equal measure on both of these hip sockets. It happens in greater measure on the left. So he has a lower limb problem that is more exaggerated on one side than the other. And he then has an upper limb problem, which is more exaggerated on one side than the other for exactly the same reasons. Um, so the way that somebody is lined up and aligns themselves affects the way that they breathe, which then affects everything about how they move through upper limbs and lower limbs. So we've got lots of mechanical things that go on there. Again, unfortunately for the person on the right here, it doesn't end there either. So as well as there being mechanical issues, there are then some chemical and emotional issues that go with that too. And so we, we touched on at the beginning that this part of our chest cavity is where we want gas to exchange. This is where the biggest concentration of, of, of blood vessels are. So this is, this is where we, we want things to happen. Um, but when we lose position and we lose alignment, it starts to happen up here. This is a much less efficient way of doing it. He has to work harder, which is why he drives himself further and further into these mechanical problems. Um, but also it's less efficient at doing the simple task of getting oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. So one of the primary functions of respiration is to balance the body's pH in terms of getting, getting carbon dioxide out right, and reducing levels of acidity. Now, if we become less efficient at doing that, acidity levels can rise. When they rise, they create a state of anxiety, they create a state of stress, and they create a desire to breathe even more. So when we're in this position here, we create these mechanical issues, which themselves can cause pain and then can cause um, stress signals also, but we're also gonna be in that aroused, stressed state almost permanently because we're not able to balance the body's gases and balance the body's pH. So this person is on all the time, okay? They are unable to turn this chain of muscles off, they're unable to resolve their mechanical issues, and they're unable just to take a breath, they're unable just to turn some things down and, and rest, which is, which is a very important part of life. Um, now what tends to happen with that is stress and anxiety levels will just go up and up and up and there comes a point where the body's central nervous system will kick in and take over and cause this person to go into a more neutral state to get some of their air out and to get all of these things back in the right place right and that's what we call crying okay so there is a chain of events that happen when somebody is in poor alignment none of which we want we don't want mechanical issues we don't want things to hurt on one side don't hurt on another side we don't want things to hurt at all um, we don't want high states of anxiety we don't want inabilities to turn off we don't want inabilities to sleep and we don't want somebody bursting into tears for no particular reason um, so alignment does matter it matters about pretty much everything um, but it really matters about how we breathe and how we breathe there has a little bit more to it than, than people might think I think um, in the world of health and fitness, there is more of an acceptance that it's something important, um, but there's less of an understanding as to actually why and what is mechanically going on and chemically going on when 
things aren't as they should be.